miserable night, so those of you who are here really want to be here. Uh, but we're gathering uh, for the third installment of our speaker series, uh, What Does It Mean to Be Human in the 21st Century? Along with our partners, the DOC, which is Accenture's uh, Global Research and Incubation Hub in Dublin, uh, we launched this major new series uh, back in December. What it means to be human in the 21st century is a cross-disciplinary lecture series aimed at exploring the human experience of today, how we understand ourselves, our world, uh, and our place within our world. And so far, we have covered what it means to be human from a scientific perspective and the origin of life on Earth with the immunologist uh, Luke O'Neill. Then we looked at the human mind and its capacity to imagine new futures and the danger of fatalism with psychologist Ian Robertson. Tonight, we change tack to explore how we shape things and how things shape us. And we're absolutely delighted to be joined by cultural historian Lisa Godson. And I'm gonna introduce Lisa in a moment, but I should actually introduce myself first. My name is Jane Olmeyer. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the director of the Trinity Long Room Hub, our Institute of Arts and Humanities. And again, for those of you who don't know the Hub, it's this lovely building literally above us. And we do three things in the Hub. We advance the excellence uh, uh, of the arts and humanities at Trinity. It's an area in which we're extremely highly rated. It's the most highly ranked faculty area, not just in Trinity, but in Ireland. And one of our classicists is going to be uh, uh, speaking tonight, Christine Morris. I think classics is 13th in the world, which is, given how many universities there are out there in the world, it's an amazing achievement, especially given austerity. Anyway, it's another lecture for another day. <laughs> The second thing we do is facilitate collaborations across disciplines because we believe the real magic happens when disciplines collide. And of course, this uh, series has really illustrated that. The third thing we do in the Hub is engage um, uh, 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 with public humanities. We're very keen to bring uh, insights uh, from uh, the arts and humanities, from academia, to uh, the widest possible audiences. And this is one of our signature events, and obviously uh, that's uh, uh, what we're gonna be doing this evening. So now let me introduce uh, Dr. Lisa Godson, who's a cultural historian, uh, who researches and writes about design, material culture, and architecture. Uh, she has many, many books, um, including Making at 1916, Visual and Material Culture of the Easter Rising. Uh, now that's actually where Lisa and I first met because that's funded by the Irish Research Council and I have to give a plug to the Irish Research Council because um, I, I chair the Irish Research Council. But we actually were doing uh, a special uh, event for the Irish Research Council in 1916 and Lisa uh, and I stood outside the GPO with uh, one of the, was it the original flag? It was a very early flag anyway. Um, but she also has uh, written a, a, a many other books. She's the director of uh, the Irish Architecture Foundation and a trustee of the Design History Society. Um, she is also a graduate uh, of Trinity and holds an honorary uh, fellowship uh, here. She works with artists, um, uh, including uh, Jesse Jones uh, on the pavilion at the uh, Venice Biennale in uh, 2017. Uh, her research into the work of Irish architects in Africa was the basis of the award-winning feature documentary uh, Build Something uh, Modern. She's the co-director of the MA in Design History and Material Culture at the National College of Art and Design. So we're really, really delighted uh, to have uh, Lisa with us this evening. Um, and we're also really delighted um, to have Christine Morris, who is the Andrew David Associate Professor in Greek Archaeology and History at Trinity. And after Lisa's talk, uh, Christine uh, uh, will curate a conversation uh, with Lisa for 10 minutes. Uh, and then we'll open up the conversation uh, to you all uh, and plenty of time for questions and uh, uh, answers. But just, I'm not going to introduce uh, Christine separately, so let me just say a few words about her here. She's an expert in the uh, archaeology of the Aegean Bronze Age, 
uh, and her interests also span to modern material culture, uh, looking at the modern reception and commodification of artifacts. So I can't think of a more perfect uh, person, a perfect interlocutor uh, uh, than, than Christine. I would like to remind you that we'll, uh, uh, anyone who's on Twitter, and I joined Twitter last week, I'm still a novice when it comes to tweeting, but I'm looking for followers uh, at Jane Olmeyer. It's my, it's my handle, is that the right word? Uh, but, but obviously we'd love you to join the conversation um, uh, at uh, hashtag uh, being human and hashtag hub matters. I'm telling you, Twitter's a whole new world. Anyway. <laughs> Let's try and trend. This is my goal. One day we'll be able to trend at one of these. Um, I also should just simply note that we, we, we're obviously live streaming this. We also will be podcasting it. So those of you um, uh, who want to share the talk this evening with others, uh, simply go to the Trinity Long Room Hub website and click on listen and uh, uh, watch. So without further ado, could I invite you all to join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Lisa Godson. Okay, um, thank you very much, Jane. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me. Thank you to you for making it out on a filthy evening. Um, it's really heartening to see so many people interested in material culture. Um, so, um, in the weeks that I've been thinking about this talk, there have been a couple of news stories and media items that seem to have addressed the theme of we, sh we shape things, shape us, um, very directly, and some of you may have seen them. So, um, for example, one was the news that the first all-female spacewalk was cancelled due to a lack of spacesuits in the correct size um, for the aspiring spacewalkers. And then there were almost numerous articles in response to a recently published book by Caroline Criado Perez called Invisible Women, Exposing Data Bias in a World Designed for Men. So I'm going to start with... Um, <coughs> yeah. I'm going to start um, with the approach to material culture that Perez takes in her book which I characterize in terms of optimization, uh, a term often used in design, in design practice, meaning the belief that the objects of everyday life should be as effective as possible in being used in the way intended. So and I'm going to look in particular at the crash test dummy and then at the vaginal speculum. So anyone who doesn't want to <laughs> know more about the design of the speculum, um, you might want to leave now. Um, and I'm going, to, I'm going to kind of follow this pattern of maybe giving, giving an example from the broader literature and then giving a case study from my own research. Um, so although um, Perez didn't use this particular term, what I took to be the focus of the book was how the implied user and that's a really important concept when we're talking about material culture. Um, the implied user of objects, systems, and spaces is overwhelmingly, in the 21st century, what we might call a normative male, and how that, in turn, makes much of the designed world inappropriate and even dangerous, in some cases, for women. So, to take car safety as an example, um, Perez noted that, here's an image of, um, book and here's Perez. So to take car safety as an example, Perez noted that in car accidents, although men are more likely to be in accidents, 47% of women were more likely to be seriously injured than men and 71% of women were more likely to be moderately injured. So she traces this back to the crash test dummy um, and we see her here tweeting um, about the appearance of an article in the Guardian about her findings, and there was you could barely escape this um, this book over the last uh, two or three weeks. <coughs> Where should I be pointing this? Oh. <laughs> um, okay, so she traces this um, this um, this strange statistic of how most more men than women are in car accidents and yet women are, are more severely injured um, to the design of and the use of the crash test dummy. As we know, these objects, properly called anthropomorphic test devices or ATDs, 
allegedly simulate the human body and are typically used to generate data about what happens to the body in various kinds of car crashes. And this data is then used by vehicle designers to design in safety features in cars. Um, on their introduction in the 1950s as a way of testing car safety, um, it was decided that the typical crash test dummy um, should be based on anthropometric charts like these. Um, and um, any designers are familiar with these charts. This is um, why the world is scaled as it is, is according to these charts, um, which measure, you know, the, the typical um, man and woman and another one and this is um, the typical human in driving position and you can see all the different tractor backrest, uh, minimum lumbar support etc etc. Um, <coughs> um, so these charts typically used by industrial designers including vehicle designers um, ensure that the crash test dummies are based on an average American male of 1.7 meters tall and weighing 76 kilograms but Perez noted that EU regulatory crash test requirements involve five tests, none of which require a female crash test dummy. And in fact, only one test of these five uses um, kind of female dummies, but they're always tested in the passenger seat rather than in the driving seat. And are just a scaled down male dummy. And as such, don't take into account women's lower bone density, different vertebrae spacing, and so on. As such, women are treated as what's called out of position drivers. Um, they sit further forward, they sit more upright, um, and as I said, they have different kind of body mass and so on. And this clearly compromises their safety. Um, although a Swedish designer has made an anthropometrically correct female dummy, this is as yet dependent on crowdsourced money to realise. So this, I think, pretty shocking data gap, as Perez calls it, in terms of actual information that designers can use, or a narrowly defined implied user, um, then is figured as one reason why women are always far less safe in cars than men are. And she draws on numerous examples, including drug testing, including the design of toilets, um, uh, the organization of space, um, and the design of numerous kind of everyday objects. If, um, as I'd suggest, we both shape and are shaped by the world, the seriousness of shaping the world around only one kind of user um, seems abundantly clear. So I use that example from Perez's book to illustrate in a very straightforward way how we might be both enabled and disabled by material culture, depending on who we are, and how the idea of the implied user shapes the world around us. Um, as well as women um, clearly being disabled by design, those who are blind, those who are deaf, those who are differently abled are also um, disabled by design. And in NCAD we actually had um, a, a research fellow um, who had gone blind in his, early in his early 20s and he said instead of talking about design for disability we should talk about people being disabled by design. Um, and Obviously, there's, there's a universal design movement which um, tries to take these factors into account. But clearly, in the 21st century, the, there needs to be far more focus on optimizing the world um, for a far wider range of users. Um, so, in terms of my own research, um, these ideas about who is the implied user very much came to the fore when I was researching the history of um, the design of the vaginal speculum, and I suppose the kind of cultural history of the vaginal speculum. So this is the instrument um, designed to be inserted into the vagina to dilate it for examination um, of the vagina and the cervix, um, for example, for smear tests, about which we've heard so much um, over the last year or so. Um, so the type of speculum on the screen here is a disposable plastic bivalve or double-billed version 
um, and this seems to be the most um, typical type in use in Ireland. In terms of the ways such instruments and their use have been researched and written about previously by academics, uh, we find that the main mode is what we might call a taxonomic approach, where rather than a consideration of the social or cultural factors involved in the development of medical instruments, the objects in question tend to be written about according to what they do in a medical sense. And it's interesting, in medical humanities, there's a small number of researchers that look at material culture, but not a really huge amount. So I find that really interesting because obviously the material effect on our body of medicine and of medicalized environments is obviously so important. Okay, so this is, um, this slide is from the contents page of what's probably the canonical work on the history of medical devices, which is a massive uh, tome called Evolution of Surgical Instruments, written by John Kirkup. And evolution, with its implication of progress, is, I think, a significant term here. Broadly speaking, the book is organized according to material, form, and function, with the central section organized into chapters focused on different instrument typologies. So, as an example, here we see the contents of chapter 12, and this is where you find um, speculums. Um, with an interesting anthropomorphism here in its reference to probes and their allies. I think that in a consideration of the experience of medical devices, so the body's experience of medical devices, we need to locate them in particular cultural practices rather than just the technical design of these objects and maybe see them in relational rather than such categorical terms. And by relational, I mean, I suppose, how we relate to the material world and how it relates to us. So in this example, what seems absent is the way the experience and meaning of the medical instrument is formed through the woman's bodily engagement with the very specific materiality of the speculum. And what's also missing is the very violent history of the speculum. So I'm just taking a mini detour, if that's okay, just because um, I think it's so interesting. So on the screen, we see um, an image from a series called Great Moments in Medical History. And these, these were posters that were distributed across doctor surgeries and pharmacists um, and drugstores all across the United States from about the mid-1950s to the mid-1970s. Um, and on the screen, the, um, the medical genius who's being celebrated is a man called J. Marion Sims. Um, and also depicted are the speculums that he invented. Um, the woman he's looking at, as if you can kind of diagnose her by sight alone, um, is one of the slaves that he used to perform gynecological experiments on without the use of anesthetic. And when slavery was abolished, he then moved to New York and established the first women's hospital. He continued his experiments, but this time he was mainly experimenting on Irish women, um, fresh off the boat, as they say. Um, again, without the use of anesthetic. And he thought that black women and Irish women um, felt pain differently um, than other white women. And there was no need to use anesthetic. So I include him here just as his work was to have such an effect on the history of gynecology. Until recently, there was a statue to him in, the, in Central Park, um, one of Ireland's leading fertility clinics. It's called after him. He went on a tour of Europe. He gave a lecture in the Rotunda Hospital. Um, and as I said, he was really deeply influential. So, but if we think of how things are invented, who they might have been experimented on, how technology develops, I think this is a really, um, this is a really interesting story. His, um, you could say his lack of consideration of the user, and he did, and he performed up to 40 different um, experimental surgeries on one of these women, um, is, speaks of a kind of dark history of this particular object, and it gets much darker, but um, I, I don't have time here <laughs> to go into it. But um, the, um, but if we think of kind of the material culture of the speculum, it became a focus um, during second wave feminism um, of empowerment, and I suppose of the user, an attempt, if you like, to shift the user back to the woman. And so this is um, an example from um, 
Sister, a magazine of the Los Angeles Women's Center um, from July 1973. And the idea that a speculum wasn't just for the hands of the doctor, but should also be used for, for self-knowledge. And there's a center that used to distribute speculums, torches and mirrors um, to women. Um, uh, a truism within design education and design marketing, particularly in the last 10 or 20 years, is the concept of user-centered design. Um, as derived from neuroscience, this sometimes takes the form of understanding objects through the concept of affordance. And that is the way the perception of the properties of things activates predetermined expectations. Within contemporary speculum design and marketing, the user and the one who is afforded is always assumed to be the one operating the speculum, even now. And um, in medical device design, that's sometimes called the proximal end and the distal end. The distal end is obviously the far end and the proximal is the close end. And the proximal end is always the gynecologist or medical professional. So, um, so I looked through the, the marketing literature of about 20 different manufacturers and only one mentioned the woman on whom the speculum was being used and that was in terms of hygiene. Um, and instead the, the implied user was the gynecologist with the main features of the speculum always described in terms of visualization and convenience. So here, um, clear acrylic, available in broad range of sizes, wide ergonomic handles, look for the color-coded handle. Um, another one, unique integrated light source for more accurate diagnosis, robust cable for your busy practice needs. Um, so in terms of the patient, um, the other user, then, they're not brought into consideration at all. And even in, um, there's a master's in medical device design in NCAD, and um, the, the guy who runs it shared with me um, all the basic kind of safety guidelines and all the best codes of practice around medical device design. And the user is never, ever mentioned as being the patient. So. That's not to say there haven't been other attempts to kind of reconceive the speculum or the user of the speculum as the woman. So this is one 3D printed um, from instructions by a Catalan collective called Gyne Punk. So they distribute instructions on how to make your own speculum but all, and also how to perform your own smear test um, and perform your own cytological analysis from their commune in Catalonia. Um, so such forms of distribution are, of course, becoming more common in the 21st century. Um, so we know that um, the V&A, for example, um, in its contemporary collection features a 3D handed, a 3D printed gun. Um, so obviously there's um, danger in these modes of distribution, but in terms of material culture, um, we might think that perhaps reconfiguring the user, distributing the ability to manufacture as well, um, is going to become um, more and more of a feature of um, being human in the 21st century. Okay, so I want to turn to the past a little bit now. Okay. Those who study and practice um, design are familiar with the ways objects and environments habituate and prompt us to behave in certain ways. So we might look at the way, for example, domestic interiors have changed over time, what that says about privacy, um, etc. Or, as we saw just now, um, the way material culture offers affordances or optimizes our abilities. Um, so I want to turn now to offer you a case study of how the study of material culture can help us understand major historical phenomena. And in fact, I'd argue that we can't understand the past and by implication the present and the future without understanding how material culture has been mobilized and maybe more importantly, experienced by others. So in this, of course, I'm not alone. Over the past decade, history, like other academic fields, <coughs> has undergone what is sometimes termed a, a material turn, meaning the material reality of daily life has been the focus of far more research than previously. 
And often this could be a little superficial, we're all familiar with the history of something through 10 objects, or 50 objects, or 100 objects. Um, and too often objects are treated as a quick visual kind of stimulus, as a departure point to address um, kind of the real history. But I just thought it was worth sharing with you an example of a really in-depth project um, that tried to address the centrality of material culture in a major change in Irish historical experience. And that's what's called the devotional revolution um, of the 19th century. So, okay. <coughs> so this term, devotional revolution, was coined by the historian Emmett Larkin um, almost 50 years ago, so in this um, article that he published in 1972 called The Devotional Revolution in Ireland, 1850 to 75. And I think it's probably one of the most widely cited essays ever written on Irish history. In it, he argued that after the famine of the 1840s, Irish Catholics underwent a revolution whereby there was a massive increase in religious personnel, such as nuns and priests, in religious buildings, in particular churches, but also um, denominational institutions, such as orphanages, industrial schools, hospitals, and so on. Um, and in attendance at mass and other sacraments, such as confession, and so on. And he kind of characterized this as a revolution. And he said, so through this, Irish Catholics became, as was the case when he was publishing his essay, the pious and orthodox faithful they are to this day. So this is 1972. Um, Larkin did mention in passing, and this is a quote from it, um, the distribution and use of devo devotional tools and aids, beads, scapulars, medals, missiles, prayer books, catechisms, holy pictures, and Agnes Day. But he just mentions them in passing, he says, and alongside all this change in um, religious personnel and building and so on, there were all these objects. So he didn't offer any kind of hard evidence though. So part of my research into the devotional revolution was to try and test his hypothesis that there had been this massive change in Irish Catholic experience um, against material evidence and kind of take material culture really seriously. Um, so part of that research involved the transcription and analysis of all the ads in the Irish Catholic Directory, which was this gazette here that probably had more ads for religious goods than any other publication in the 19th century. So anyway, I transcribed all the ads from 1838 to 1898, so the six-year period. I think there were roughly 7,000 ads, so um, it felt like it took 60 years <laughs> to do it, um, and then took another 60 years, it felt like, to kind of analyse it and make sense of all this data. And this is kind of what I found. Okay, so <clears throat> this is um, kind of trying to periodize what kind of objects are being advertised and then I kind of try and go and find other evidence and try and support what I was finding. So I found that in the 1830s, 40s, most of the ads are for vestments, altar plate and books. The 1850s, we have the introduction of devotional objects for the laity. 1860s church furnishings, 1870s, there's much more specialization, so you have church bells, um, incense, uh, communion bread and so on, and then the 1880s, we have patented goods. So I suppose, um, just really quickly, um, I thought it was worth kind of following the arc of this time period, um, just to try and understand maybe what this developing experience of the material world might have been like for Irish Catholics. So if we look at the 1830s and 40s when with these really, um, I'd say 90% of the ads are for vestments, um, altar plates and books. Okay, so like this. Um, okay, so it's, it's kind of not surprising that these were the first objects that were um, being advertised for a church that was supposedly undergoing reform where there's much more church building and in particular where there's this big attempt to kind of bring Irish Catholics into line with the rest of Europe and try and make them um, kind of more orthodox if you like. Um, these were the basic tools with which mass could be celebrated and the sacraments administered. So in terms of material experience for Irish Catholics, we might call this a time period of systematization. 
um, partly through these objects. As ritual objects that were part of an interlocking system, each item of vestment and each item of plate had a clearly defined function that was central to the efficacy of the ceremony with which they were performed. And they were also really specialised in form under the regulations of the Roman Missal. So that dictation, for example, the chalice should be at least eight inches in height and their kind of substance and manufacture um, were also governed by rules regarding the materials they're made of, the ways they might be handled and who is permitted to make them. So for example, the, the chalice had to be made of gold or silver, the pattern, if made of anything other than gold, had to be gilt on the concave side, and only by way of exception, in case of extreme poverty, might chalice be made of stannum, um, which is this alloy of tin and lead, although the cup still had to be gilt on the inside, and those made of glass, wood, copper, or brass are not permitted. And this is a time when there's, um, when universal primary education is introduced to Ireland, and although it's supposed to be non-denominational, um, it's when the catechism is introduced to Irish Catholics in a really widespread way. And in the catechism, we can see that Irish, school, Irish Catholic school children are supposed to, to, under, to learn off by heart what is the meaning of these objects, what should they be made of, and why. So they're actually learning, they're actually kind of acquiring all this knowledge about material culture and about the correct um, mode of religious <coughs> material culture. <coughs> and um, I, would, I would think that this is a way that the material world is being systematized. Um, and that in terms of post-famine Catholicism, it suggests that duty and the systematic following of rules, um, including the correct use of objects, could lead to salvation. And this is a time that you also have um, the, the widespread sort of attachment of indulgences to, for example, um, using holy water, blessing yourself, saying prayers in the correct way, and so on. Um, so I think this that material culture really helped centralize religious power in the persona of the priest and in the power of the institution. Um, the next phase, I'll go through this quickly, um, as identified in the ads and supported by other evidence, um, involved the distribution of religious goods for the laity. So up to the late 1840s, you mainly got these ads, um, and they'll say things like, for priests or for communities of nuns. In the late 1840s, suddenly you see objects being advertised for the laity. Um, for example, in particular, rosary beads and holy pictures, but also candles. So, um, this slide then is kind of typical of the ads that I was transcribing. Um, and this is from the Irish Catholic <laughs> Directory in 1853. Um, and there's a long, long list of the kinds of image that were available images that were available to Irish Catholics at this time and often they, they might be sold to wholesalers you know for a dozen and they might just say assortment of saints um, but you could also subscribe to have prints sent you at home um, and so on and what we find in particular so there's there's details about so like a series of 15 beautiful prints by the best masters exquisitely covered colored um, and then we have a list of the subject matter and um, what we find in particular is an emphasis on orthodoxy. So Miss Byrne um, is a pains, so Miss Byrne, often these kind of, the shops or the, the wholesalers that are selling these are, are often women and they're all located around Essex Quay, so kind of just at the bottom of Parliament Street in that area in particular. Um, so for example, Miss Byrne of Essex Quay emphasizes that to, to readers that the style of images she's selling have received the approbation of the Archbishop of Paris. Miss Dowling claims the images she sells are from the most approved foreign models and the main selling point of the People's Gallery of Religious Engravings, also on Essex Quay, was that it had been extensively circulated by the conferences of St. Vincent de Paul in France. Okay, so we've got, again, we've got this emphasis on kind of systematization and orthodoxy. And then these are some of kind of the fancier kind of prints that were distributed in Ireland at the time. Um, and they're nearly all made in Paris, these, um, these prints. <coughs> okay, so as suggested by the ads in the directory in the second half of the 19th century, um, 
We see the increased distribution of cheap prints for Irish Catholics who are introduced to likenesses of the Holy Family and a novel array of continental saints. Um, and these, um, these images, for example, um, of the Sacred Heart, which kind of changes from being an actual heart, as we have here on the left, to on the right hand side, um, the actual image of, of Christ with the heart in his chest. Um, in addition to the systematization, we might characterize um, the experience of Irish Catholics then as being more affective. So um, there's a number of kind of best-selling books which instruct Irish Catholics how they should interact with these images. And it's often to try and identify with what is being depicted. Um, so we have kind of systematization and we have affective. And then, in the 1860s, we have the introduction, um, or we have in the ads, this big shift towards church furnishing. furnishing. So we've got furnishing firms, we also have statue makers. Um, and just, um, do they sound Irish? Do they look Irish? These are the main names that come up. Um, <laughs> El Vecchio, Nanetti, Machini, Bernardi, Caschiani, and Kepi. Um, okay, and um, they're nearly all Italian firms. Um, and what's interesting, I suppose, about what they're selling, what they're advertising, is that they're selling statues, the exact same kind of depiction, the same figure, but it could be, it's available at eight inches, 10 inches, right up to church size. So you've got the exact same depiction, domesticated and institutionalized at the same time. So I think what this kind of suggests in terms of the material culture of Catholicism at this time period then is a sense of imminence like identical religious goods um, could be in both the church and people's homes. And then by the 1880s, you've got patented goods. So this slide here shows um, an altar bread baking oven and then Harrington's fragrant incense for, for the altar, um, especially prepared um, in Cork. And just to say that, I just didn't want to leave it out, um, but basically, as with the quote from Ulysses on the previous slide, um, religion pays. Um, I think studying the material culture of Irish Catholicism this time is also really important in terms of kind of a business history um, as well. And um, we can learn something about business history and industrial history, as well as the shaping of mentalities and the material world, um, which was so dominant um, for so many people in Ireland um, for probably 150 years. Okay. So for the final part of my talk, I want to turn to a consideration of the materiality of process. So how things are made, where things come from. And my two examples, they don't have a lot in common, but um, are a toaster and then Irish architecture in Africa in the mid 20th century. Okay. So um, this is an image from a project that um, when I show it to students, they really, really love it. And um, so on the screen, you see a simple toaster costing, I think, £3.94. So this is an English project um, in Asda, and purchased by the designer Thomas Thwaites. On the right hand side, we see all the different components of the toaster. So he bought this toaster and then completely dismantled it. In kind of looking at it, um, he reflected on. Uh, all the human ingenuity that had gone into creating this object. And you can see, and all the different materials. And I suppose, um, rather madly, decided to try and make his very own electrical toaster. Just from scratch, or from, sorry, completely from scratch, using just the technologies and materials he could access himself. Okay, so, First of all, he attempted to extract iron ore from a mine in Scotland. He found copper in a river. He made his own plastic from potato starch. He made a mold from a tree trunk. And then using a leaf blower and a bin, um, and he tried to smelt the iron ore. And then finally, he used a microwave to complete the process. He found a patent online that said you could extract iron ore um, 
using just a domestic microwave um, on full power for an hour. And um, I've seen the film of it and it's really alarming. To this <laughs> big lump of iron ore and metal right in the middle of a, of a microwave. It's glowing and sparking and so on. Um, and this is the result. And the result of both the <laughs> And then um, he actually... Uh, he actually put it on the shelf um, in Tesco's and um, or in Curry's or some electrical store, and all the toasters around it were, you know, three ninety nine. The value range was two ninety nine. The fancier ones were sixty pounds, and his one I think cost something like eighteen hundred pounds. <laughs> how much money he spent in it? Um, and he did plug it in, but he wasn't able to insulate the wires. He said that uh, Kew Garden wouldn't let him go and kind of hack into the rubber tree um, so he could insulate the wire. Um, so he plugged it in, there was 40 volts going right through, um, through it. The element burnt itself out, but it did manage to toast for a few seconds. So he considered it a partial success. Um, so while in some ways a kind of a silly and slightly playful project, I think in terms of what it means to be human in the 21st century, it's a really, really, uh, it's a really clever and really serious project um, because it draws attention, I think, um, to how alienated from the material processes by which the objects of daily life come into being, how alienated we are from those processes. And of course, the ways that, um, of how we consume material goods threaten the environment. Um, and I think, Definitely for the 21st century, it's kind of obvious, but I think it's only by being attentive to the actual material processes by which things come to be that we can fully understand how we both shape and are shaped by the world. Okay, and then kind of final quick case study um, addresses this. phenomenon, um, almost a kind of hidden history, of Irish architects who produced work in Africa, particularly from the 1950s to 1970s. And Jane mentioned in the introduction that um, I, I undertook this research originally for a documentary film that came out in 2011. And um, again, a bit, bit of a slow worker, but I've recently published an essay about it um, in a book on modern religious architecture. Okay, so... <clears throat> On the screen, then, we see some examples of this architecture in Africa, um, designed by Irish architects. And these images come from the archive of one of the main architects involved, who's a man called Pierce McKenna. Um, his work has never really been studied. He's sometimes mentioned in passing due to his involvement in the design of St. Michael's Church in Dunleary, or on DIT, or TUD, Kevin Street. Um, and He's just one of a really, um, I, in trying to kind of research this, I put a call out through the RIAI, so the Professional Body for Architects, through the Architectural Association in Ireland. Um, just, I put this call out saying, if any architects have, have produced any work in Africa, can they please get in touch? Um, and I was looking in particular at kind of the time period from the 1940s to about the 1970s. And about 25 different architects got in touch and said, um, and told kind of various stories of how they ended up designing buildings for Africa. So some of them were quite funny, like there was one guy and his, um, the chairman of the local county council had a brother who's a missionary in Africa. And he said the locals had been making concrete blocks and they had 50,000 concrete blocks and they asked this architect to design a church to make use of this 50,000 concrete blocks. So he kind of sketched it out for them pretty much on the back of a beer mat or an envelope. And then 10 years later, he got back a photograph of the church that they'd actually built his designs. Um, Pierce McKenna was much more prolific. Um, he, as I said, he'd never kind of been studied before. Um, but when I got in touch with his family to ask if there was any material related to his work in Africa, um, they literally came across hundreds and hundreds of drawings in a national um, treasure trove um, and they also had slides that they'd never looked through. Um, so we found out really that McKenna was responsible for literally hundreds of churches, hospitals and schools in West Africa from the late 1940s to the late 1960s and these were all commissioned by Irish missionary orders. 
So just to go back to this theme of the materiality of the process, what's partly remarkable about this work is that it was designed from a distance, um, often by students, because it was pro bono work, um, who were working in McKenna's office thousands of miles away from where the buildings were actually constructed, and they never actually got to see the buildings with their own eyes. I think McKenna went to Africa, from what we can figure out, maybe four different times, that's it, and yet hundreds of his designs were, were built, um, especially in Nigeria. But, so this kind of, this distance and this way of working um, partly accounts, I think, for how innovative a lot of this work was. Um, <coughs> And this is an example. This is a church at Uyu in Nigeria um, under construction in the late 1950s. And um, what, um, so what we found out, or what I found out during, during the research was that the students um, who mainly designed these buildings um, absolutely loved working on them because they were given a total free reign. There wasn't much going on in Dublin at the time, there was Bosaurus, that, that, that was kind of it. And the church in particular, the Catholic church in particular, was deeply conservative. Um, this is a quote from Archbishop John Charles McQuaid, no statue or picture is erected in any church or public oratory, no plan of a church is accepted without my personal censorship. And he was very notorious for interfering, for example, in um, architectural competitions. This is. Um, Church of the Immaculate Virgin Mary of the Miraculous Medal, Klonsky, Dublin. Um, and the actual winner of the competition to design that church um, had designed a very modernist scheme and John Charles McQuaid interfered and got this kind of very conservative um, architecture built instead. So partly because um, this architecture was being designed for Africa, um, the architects were given, as they said, a totally free reign. And so Michael O'Doherty, one of the architects we interviewed who worked for Pierce McKenna said, I recall one missionary telling us, just build something modern. Okay. So I think what, what this says then about this distance and this process of making is that um, the church then pre was presenting a modernizing face in Africa while at home presenting itself as the guardian of tradition but there was this creative freedom afforded to the architects. Um, the, the process of designing these churches was partly also based on pragmatism, the pragmatism of kind of distance. Um, so on the slides then we see um, a drawing for a station church seating 200, that's what it says on the drawing, um, and then two actual station churches, and these are from the slides that um, Pierce McKenna's family had. Um, so, <coughs> what seems to have happened is that um, the missionaries and the architect established a program whereby a unique parish or diocesan church would be sited in the centre of a territory and um, with a number of smaller standardised station churches in the surrounding area. And some of the priests that we interviewed said there were up to 50 of these kind of churches um, in the surrounding area. So the architects in Dublin made one prototypical set of drawings which was then sent to Africa and very much open to interpretation. So we have these, um, these architects that think of themselves as kind of, one of them said, mainline card-carrying modernist with all the kind of precision and ideological baggage that that brings, um, designing this set of instructions, sending them out to Africa and then this huge variety of kind of st supposedly standardized but locally interpreted um, buildings were made. I think um, what this says, it might say, seem to say much about design in the 21st century, but I think the idea of kind of collaboration of the user as such, so the people who are receiving these plans who are not professional builders, not professional architects, interpreting them, kind of customizing them themselves according to the materials available is a really interesting um, indication um, and maybe has echoes within kind of certain kinds of contemporary design practice where collaboration and um, collectivity and um, the use of local materials is to the fore. Um, and then <coughs> just to say that a further aspect of this, this nature of kind of designing from afar um, is the nature of the evidence left behind. Uh, with no professional builder on site, the architectural drawings are really kind of over detailed. So there's actual explanations on the architectural drawings for why things are designed the way they are. Um, so for example, as on the screen, 
the, the method of making concrete blocks is actually designed into the drawing, or is actually kind of written on the drawings, how to make concrete, how to make concrete blocks, but also kind of why things are being designed the way they are. So here it says, um, rain, when even driven by a strong wind, will not penetrate. And it's talking about kind of how to arrange the, um, the walls and so on. And if you look at conventional architectural drawings, especially from that time, um, less litig litigious times, you see a far simpler um, kind of arrangement. Okay. <coughs> and I think with the, with the rise in kind of making culture and DIY culture and so on, and the distribution of um, design knowledge, I think that these schemes here, um, I don't think it's too far-fetched to say that I find them quite inspiring that someone could communicate like that. No internet, they just send out these drawings, they write the instructions and then these buildings get built as a kind of approximation of what the architect intended. Okay, conclusion. Um, <coughs> I just really wanted to conclude um, with um, two quick examples um, of recent kind of student work from, from the MA in Design History and Material Culture. Um, just to say that really how we shape the material world and how, how it shapes us um, is a continual kind of dialogue. And, but it's only through kind of slightly obsessive research like transcribing ads or trying to find drawings and attics, or in this case, um, cataloging every single bollard on Thomas Street, as this student did, um, <laughs> that we can fully come to understand how, how we both shape the world and how it shapes us. So um, Jess actually went and catalogued every uh, bollard on Thomas Street and she looked at how streets and street furniture is often designed according to kind of an ideal user a, a, in a kind of almost utopian paradigm, um, an ideal rational user and um, the image in the top right is from this very influential Traffic in Towns 1963 um, where pedestrians were separated out um, from cars, where everything looked neat and tidy, and, um, and so on. And this is a bollard um, kind of at the top of Bridgefoot Street and where Thomas Street kind of turns into James's Street. And um, what's interesting then is that she actually went and kind of spent time observing the bollard and how people interacted with it. Um, and she noted that the official pedestrian path um, marked in blue in the slide in the bottom right um, was continually being ignored by people and instead the pedestrian what's called desire line marked in red is how people actually interacted with the bollard. So just to say that amongst all the talk about optimization and users and so on we, we rarely use the material world in the way it's intended and this is kind of just a nice example. And then just finally um, much as we're surrounded by design, obviously, the, the world seems ever more designed. Um, there's always a place for improvisation. And this is from um, a study by another student, by Linda Dunn. And this is a tape measure once owned by Dr. James Hanlon, who was a blind and deaf doctor here in Dublin. Um, and he was, he was in practice in the, from kind of post-Second World War up to the 1980s. And this was adapted um, when he went blind by his, um, his assistant who added beads. It's just a regular um, tape measure purchased, I think, in the haberdashery department of Switzers. And um, his assistant actually attached beads and thread to it so that he could kind of operate in the world. And um, this student, we did a book a few years ago called um, The Secret Lives of Objects. And this student, Linda Dunn, um, did massive amounts of research into the history of the senses, the materiality of the senses, but also focused really on this object and did a number of interviews. And um, Dr. Jane Tannen's children um, said uh, that there was absolutely no way he could have really functioned as a doctor or functioned in the world without this really simple tape measure that had just been kind of adapted and improvised um, for his use. Okay, so thank you.
Um, I think I'd just like to start the conversation by saying how absolutely inspiring that was. As Jane said, I'm an archaeologist. I study very old objects and things. In fact, archaeologists, as you'll know, only have things to work with. So the idea of a material turn, as Lisa um, has said, uh, which spreads across other disciplines like history, anthropology, design, uh, is a really exciting kind of uh, space between disciplines. Um, so I wonder if I could start off by asking you, I know you've worked, for example, the 1916 project that Jane mentioned, maybe with some of these other things, how this kind of approach might have allowed you to work with people in other disciplines that you wouldn't have been able to? Um, would you use a mind, Lisa? I have a lapel mic, that's great. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, Sorry, what was the question? <laughs> so, wh whether working in this way with materiality has opened up interdisciplinarity more than might have been the case in the past? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I've, I've done some work with uh, legal academics, um, for example, who have looked at kind of the interior of the of, um, of courtrooms and kind of who sits where. And I think, though, what this approach really does um, and what I try and do with my students because on the MA students come from all kinds of backgrounds and often they're, they're rarely ever designers, there's no kind of undergraduate course in design history so we often have people from linguistics, from history, from sociology, from psychology, etc. And I suppose what I try and do is try and help them see that you can almost kind of really analyze almost any aspect of the material world, as long as you do enough research. <laughs> um, so I suppose um, it's, it's definitely enabled me to, to work with those students and to kind of try and encourage them to bring you know, their prior knowledge to bear. But it's almost like consciousness raising. So you know, when people kind of suddenly realize, oh my god, we're surrounded by all this stuff, we don't know where it's from, we don't know who made it, we don't know how it got here. It's quite dizzying. It's almost like the world is kind of called into, into life in a different way. I think that's absolutely true. And um, it's, we did the same thing. We were talking, we were having a little pre-conversation on Friday. And we found that we were doing almost exactly the same kinds of activities. So I make my students write object biographies. They're archaeologists, but I make them go and bring something from home. Um, some modern stuff to think about it in exactly that way. And I mean, I certainly hope everyone will go home and look at their toaster <laughs> or other objects. So, I mean, that, that, that our, our kind of blindness and lack of sensitivity to materiality is extraordinary. Um, and obviously, really. if we took it seriously, we, we, we might consume as much as we do, but there is that. But, but also, I suppose, what, um, so that's what, it, what I didn't talk about there really is. Um, in terms of the 21st century is the whole issue of hoarding and um, and how we acquire objects and when we let objects go and so on and I think that will be definitely um, that's definitely a massive issue is how much do we want physical artifacts um, and how much you know since we live online so much of the time um, will physical artifacts kind of retain their kind of aura for us and I think the answer is yes I mean there's been such a shift to analog for example like graphic design students, the letterpress studio in NCAD is never been busier. Um, photography students, you see them going back and, and reusing 19th century photographic techniques. So kind of, I think that relationship to materiality is, is really interesting. Yeah. It's a bit like the idea that, you know, we thought vinyls were gone, but they've come back and so on. You mentioned the word aura. So I wanted to kind of pick up and relate that back to the 3D printing that you mentioned, because oh, right. yeah. the other thing, we're living in this kind of um, digital, virtual world, but at the same time we can create actual objects of virtual things. Do you think that they have a kind of problematic relationship with materiality or authenticity? Are we sort of in a strange space about whether those things are authentic or not? Um, I think... That, I think I think if they, if they exist, they're authentic anyway. Um, I think there's way too many of them being made. I mean, somebody told me the term crap, project, crap objects, <laughs> which is basically all these test pieces, especially if they're, um, they're, they're not sustainably made. And I think, 
I think, I mean, I think obviously mass production and identical objects has, uh, you know, for, you know, since the Industrial Revolution, or maybe since the invention of printing, there's always been, you know, you could, you could go back and analyze that and, and wonder, is it problematic? I don't think so. I think um, objects become individualized and personalized in so many different ways. So, I mean, through the idea of object biographies and, and that kind of thing. Something else I was dying to ask you about, because I also studied ritual 4,000 years ago, so a long time ago. You're talking about ritual objects, and I'm so taken by the decade in which the objects for people, for the laity, became more common. Mm. And it looked like it was a, an attempt to sort of control or silent the kinds of objects that people were using. Is there an opportunity for objects to be subversive as well? You know, to use the wrong kinds of objects in ritual? Um, yeah, well, if you've ever seen any schlock horror films where uh, <laughs> <laughs> black mouths and so on. Um, yeah, I think so. I mean, I think, I think that you hear these terms um, kind of open systems and closed systems. So obviously this, um, this really tight control of the materials, of the way things are made, of how something becomes sacred, how it becomes unsacred, and, and so on. Um, at that time period, that's obviously a very kind of tight, closed system. And some people would characterize, I mean, I know this very famous Umberto Eco essay where he says, like, PCs are Protestant and um, Apple Macs are Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think, and I think that idea, you know, if you have a, I mean, recently I had a real disaster with my laptop and um, I had to bring it to data recovery place and they said, oh, Apple has um, have stopped us being able to even recover data. We have a guy in Russia working oops, on a way of, um, uh, working on a program which would enable us to, to access it. Um, and that idea that you can't actually get in and fix your smartphone or fix your, your Apple Mac and the kind of the right to repair, there's a, a law of the right to repair in a number of the states in America um, that Apple have kind of, uh, that, you know, that Apple have been prosecuted under. And that's very much, I can't remember the original question, sorry, but that's very much a kind of a closed system, you could say then. But I think the idea of kind of an open system is also being embraced in parallel with that. So you've got projects like phone blocks, which is, um, this idea that you make a kind of modular mobile phone and you can add more memory if you want and just again the, the issue of kind of the excess of goods in the world um, and so on. So do you think if, if we characterize the devotional objects as a closed system, oh, right. does that suggest something about the church's perception of objects as having potential power to mislead oh, yeah. people? Well I think that, um, I mean what's happening you know, in that period after, you know, the 1850s onwards, is you've got this kind of, um, you've got this upsurge in manufacturing techniques and mass production. And so with mass production, obviously, then you can kind of control imagery and you can control visual depictions and the, you know, the Council of Trent, um, what it says about um, religious images is that people should not worship the images themselves, but the prototype to which they refer. So there was a kind of a danger of materiality, as in sort of maybe a particular statue acquiring particular power. But once you have mass production and you have the same depiction of, you know, the sacred heart hanging in your, on your kitchen wall, in a statue, in the church, um, and so on, you would think that even though there are more material goods, um, the materiality itself becomes less important and there's less danger of fetishization and idolatry, I suppose, really, in a religious sense. So you've got this kind of funny fusion of kind of mass production, mass circulation techniques, mass transport, and then this um, very tightly controlled kind of material culture. Yeah. I can't resist talking about the specular bit. Okay. I mean, that was just an extraordinary example. So again, one of the things that archaeologists spend a lot of time doing is making taxonomies and oh, right. yeah. ca characterizing things. And I thought it was so interesting the way you described the way uh, that they're trapped in that kind of way of thinking about objects, rather than if you use those ideas of biography, print, production to consumption, and you think about all the consumers and the stakeholders, that they're really not doing that, that the actual people 
um, that they're being used on are, are not being thought about at all, that the medical yeah. kind of mode is, is trapped in, in that. And even it's in just the, very strong. Even in the code of practice, I mean, it, you know, like looking through all the kind of legislation around medical devices, and as I said, kind of, there's an international a professional organization of medical devices, and, and they Reading, reading through this like 300 pages of best practice and it's all about you know testing on the users and so on and um, how to design for the users, how to make it more user friendly and so on and it's all about the medical professionals. And it's really interesting because um, I think um, in certain countries or in certain kind of healthcare systems and maybe in certain hospitals in Ireland, I think I heard recently about somebody's experience in one hospital which really sounded like they've been a lot of service design where kind of the patient experience have been taken into consideration from kind of arrival from in terms of doctors always introducing themselves and giving their name and asking the patient their name in terms of checking that it's definitely the left leg that's being amputated <laughs> <laughs> and so on and yet then you heard i don't know joe duffy over the last you know it's just this litany over the last 10 days of how people were treated you can think of that as a design issue as well and then you have the actual kind of objects and environments, of course. But I just think there's a real lack of kind of design thinking, especially in Ireland, the Lewis line's not joining up, this weird thing. Do you remember they were gonna have junctions in Dublin, J8, J25, you sometimes still see them on, on, on signs around the city. So I think that really kind of deep systematic attention to all users is you know, really sorely needed. But, user isn't just, and design isn't just an artifact, and the user isn't, as I said, somebody at just one end of the spectrum is person on the other end as well, so. Yeah. Well, it just seems like a really extreme example of, you know, we talk about stakeholders who are all the different people oh, yeah. involved. It's a horrible <laughs> term, I know. But, you know, it's an obvious stakeholder not being involved in the, in the conversation. Yeah, but well, it's interesting because vacuum obviously means mirror and to look, and, um, yeah, it's never, you know, kind of the other, the other end with the feeling kind of um, user. And you see that kind of privileging of vision and visuality all the time um, in all kinds of material culture or in the way material culture is described and therefore how design happens. And thinking of the other senses and if we think of universal design, um, that, it's another factor in there as well. Yeah. And that, that's a very interesting way of pulling in the idea of the tyranny of the gaze that, you know, even the vocabulary we use, that, you know, we're looking at things, and if you think of all the verbs you use, they're all very visual things. Mm. And when you were talking about people being excluded from design, I, I would, uh, through disability, I was thinking that in archaeology as well, there's this huge interest in all of the senses. Mm. And a colleague recently wrote a, a very influential book about the archaeology of the senses. Um, and we have a, a colleague who's an examiner for us who is actually deaf. And she criticized it because she said he presupposed in the distant past that everybody was able, that they could see, that they could hear. And he didn't, even though he was thinking about all those things, he didn't include anything um, about that. So I suppose that's an, another stage in this thinking that's already there in some of the things you've described. Yeah, and I mean, students I worked with in I used to teach in the Royal College of Art and a um, student I worked with for, for a while there. He went on to design um, environments for people with dementia and was in, kind of in care homes to kind of support independence for as long as possible and also to support dignity. And it was really, really interesting. He designed these, um, like it wasn't just the kind of the technical aspects, but also um, the, um, he designed like tableware and bedroom environments. And um, he made like, sort of knobs very evident. He made these cups that looked like a child's drawing of a cup and he was saying that, you know, he worked with um, cognitive scientists on it and they were saying that the, uh, the kind of the archetypal cup is probably the best reference point for somebody living in that kind of environment. They will recognize it as a cup for longer if it's designed in a particular way, whereas most, um, most of the time it's, it's just scaled up versions of infant feeding cups that are supplied to places like that and therefore take away people's dignity and independence and stuff. So yeah. yeah. Okay, I have one thing I wanted to ask you, um, which um, there's another aspect of, of objects about the idea of an object not being thrown away or mass produced. The idea of an object being inalienable. 
um, so that's probably a strange word for most people, but what it means is something um, that, that you feel so belongs to you that you couldn't imagine giving it away, throwing it away, disposing of it, so perhaps everyone would go away and think about what is, it's a bit like, you know, Gollum and my precious, my ring, the thing I can't give away. So it's a really mean question, would you share with everybody one object that you would think would be inalienable and, and why? Because I think that gets to the heart of why objects matter so much to us. Well, I can tell you a funny story of um, a set of objects that to one kind of demographic group, if you like, were utterly inalienable and to another had to be got rid of. And this was um, when um, I was researching my master's thesis and it was about the kind of the design and material culture of the 31st International Eucharistic Congress, which was this big, this massive um, Catholic kind of festival um, in 1932. And it had always been looked at in terms of legitimizing being a fool, being in power, so very much from a political history point of view. And I couldn't find any objects relating to the Congress in kind of the normal places like the National Museum or whatever. So I wrote to the Irish Times, the Independent, Ireland's own, great, um, if you want some Catholic chat, that's who you write to, and said, if, if any readers, this is in the 90s, and I said, if any readers have any objects related to the Eucharistic Congress, can you get in touch? And um, I was staying with my parents, I was home from London for a few weeks, and I think we kind of broke the uh, phone answering machine, is that right, Mum? Um, <laughs> something like 200 people got in touch and sent me Super 8 footage, diaries, so some people who had been at the Congress were still alive at that stage. What was really interesting though was, there were all these people who had been at the Congress and they were saying, I'll allow you to come over and photograph my chair that Cardinal such and such touched, or um, my sacred heart that has souvenir of the Eucharist to Congress you know, printed on the bottom of it. Um, so there was one group, and, and for them, these objects were utterly inalienable. They couldn't let them go, they were doing me a huge favor letting me even see them. On the other hand then, I got, I think about 20 letters and a number of phone calls from people who had inherited houses or come into possession through relatives of souvenirs from the Congress. And um, there was one woman, and this is very typical, who wrote to me and said, obviously I can't just throw it out, but I don't want this in the house. And so many people, and it was around the time, dear daughter, love Nicole Klein, all the stuff around imagine laundries were first um, broadcast that year. The year I was kind of trying to finish my thesis. <laughs> and, um, and um, yeah, they, they, they were just objects that were utterly alienable, um, but they didn't want to sell them. So they couldn't really be commodified. So they were kind of zombie objects. They couldn't, be, they couldn't just be thrown in the bin. You can't just throw a religious object in the bin. At the same time, they absolutely couldn't have them in the house. So that was, kind of, that was a kind of neat illustration of how kind of bigger kind of historical occurrences really can get illuminated by people's relationship with, with material culture. Okay, I'd like to thank Lisa so much for uh, making materiality so much more obvious to everyone and I mean such eloquent and very moving examples um, of different forms of materiality so I, I do hope that everyone goes home and looks at everything not just their toaster differently but I think Jane wants to open up the conversation yeah. and get your takes on things. Christine, thank you, thank you. Elizabeth. It's over to you guys, there's about 10 minutes for Q&A, if we have any. Now, the acoustics in here aren't great, so I'm gonna get you to use the mic, and there's a roving mic here and a roving mic here. So does anybody want to ask you a question? There's one in the middle here, uh, uh, Aoife. I'm gonna say, it's always the one in the middle, sorry about that. <laughs> Is there another, another question, just so we can get the mic lined up? Any other questions? It's very hard for me to see. Oh yeah, there's one at the back here. So would you mind going ahead and then we'll take two questions and then we'll keep it moving. Please introduce yourself. Uh, my name's Emma. That was fantastic. Hi, Thank you so much. I oh. loved it. Really interesting. Thank you very much. And I'm also heartened that so many people like material culture, in which I have a master's and it's so exciting to be somewhere like this. Um, I declutter people's homes and I'm doing some research oh. about this at the moment. And it's so funny what you just said about not being able to let go of the objects. I have a collection of old family photographs from a Texan person and I, she wanted to get rid of them and I can't get rid of them, I've had them for seven years. Anyway, what I want to ask is, is there, is there um, anywhere that uh, you would recommend me looking to find out more about that kind of anxiety around objects and our kind of inability to 
Yeah, let go of them. Why they become inalienable. Yeah. Thanks very much, Emma. The question up at the back. Yes. Um, hello, I'm Kathleen. Oh, uh, I know you. Uh, I don't tweet, Jane, but I took advantage of your saying that we should to look up something about Sam Shepard's play, True West, on toasters, where about 40 post toasters are banged up in every production or destroyed. And when I went online, I found out something else. So, Lisa, take a deep breath. I don't want to put you on the spot. Uh, but when I opened up my phone, I found out that Notre Dame is on fire yeah. and that they, uh, it's collapsing. And so... In Paris? In Paris, yeah. In Paris. yeah. And so, it after what you had been talking about, I thought that once you took a deep breath to recover from that news, to think about what it means when we rebuild places like that, and that the material culture will be what's lost. The wall, stone walls are going to mostly survive, but the material culture of mostly the 19th century and there is already gone. Thanks, Kathleen. I, I, I just noticed it on Twitter, uh, so it's not fake news, it's really awful. The cathedral, oh, no. it looks as if it's been completely engulfed in flames, yeah. so I know we're all just totally shocked. So you've got two questions there, Lisa. Um, one from Emma about basically the anxiety of getting rid of stuff. <laughs> and then uh, Kathleen's um, hugely important question about the material culture that's lost. Would you please? Okay, so, um, well, you could re read an F minor on um, in inalienable objects. Um, an F minor? Yeah. E -E -I -N -E um, she, she's the person who kind of coined, coined that phrase. Um, she's an anthropologist. Um, and as with a lot of anthropologists, she's, she's talking about a non-Western kind of society as her case study. But as other anthropologists, she kind of generalizes that. Um, and she she talks about it um, yeah she just she she talks about objects that cannot be alienated and um, also that in in relation to kind of gift giving so gifts are another big concept in material culture this idea that human society is basically based around ideas of reciprocation and um, whether that's kind of paying your taxes and expecting good health care uh, <laughs> or um, or how a kind of social circle might kind of stick together because somebody gives you something, you have to give something back and, and that makes a social bond, whatever. But um, inalienable, as she defines it, is, um, what is it? keeping while giving, um, which is that um, by treating something as inalienable, you're um, kind of asserting a certain kind of status. Is that right? Do you want to say more about that? Yeah. We know much better. No, no, I think that's absolutely Oh, right, okay. Um, but there are, um, I suppose because I've looked a lot at Catholicism, then you know if you have it doesn't have something doesn't have to materially change to become common. And a really kind of famous essay on material culture, Igor Kopitov, um, who talks about commoditization as process, and he kind of talks about how the same object can go through many lives and can become a commodity at one stage, which means it's general, it's not singular, so something that costs five euro is the exact same as anything else that costs five euro when it's a commodity, you know, um, like it could be a hundred pencils, it could be ten bottles of water, as long as they all cost five euro then they're common to each other. But then you singularize something by attributing a different kind of value to it other than a commodity kind of value. But then something might be re-commodified, so if somebody dies you can sell on their possessions and therefore at that moment you're re-commodifying them. That idea that you know all of our objects can go through these cycles of commodification and decommodification and so on. It's another good essay. Peter Stalybrass wrote this amazing essay called Marx's Coat, um, and it's about um, again it's about that idea of commodification. But basically, the kind of the shtick or the story that's at the centre of it is that when Karl Marx was researching capital um, in the British Library. He was also very poor and sometimes he had to pawn his overcoat to be able to get money to feed his family. Um, and at that stage then he was commodifying a possession, he was alienating it from himself. And the essay is partly about how in the 19th century that's what happened with goods a lot of the time, that's what happened with personal possessions, 
something could be, you know, your most dearly loved possession could be your wedding ring or whatever, but you, you'd have to realize its commodity value very frequently to be able to survive. And anyway, the, the story in this is that when Karl Marx has his coat in the pawn shop and it is a commodity as such, he can no longer go do his research into commodities um, <laughs> because he won't be admitted into the British Library without an overcoat. He kind of says he's, a, he's foreign, he's Jewish, and he's got no overcoat. So in the 19th century, it's a no no. He wouldn't be allowed into the reading room of the British Museum. Um, and it's only when he takes his coat out of the pawn that he can actually. So when he re-singularizes it or decommodifies it, then he can go and, and do his research. And in, and in Capital, he talks about the difference between exchange value and use value. And he kind of says, a coat is merely this much fabric, this many buttons, these many labor hours. But because of the way we treat material culture, where we don't just see commodities, where we don't just see use value, which is what something is good for, like a coat's good for keeping warm, but we attribute status, or we're encouraged to attribute status and all these other values, that's no longer what a coat is within the commodity world of the 19th century. So it's a really clever essay which mixes all those things together. But wrinkles in, coat, in clothes in the 19th century were called memories. It was another term for wrinkles. So I remember that next time they don't iron something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Question. About reconstruction, is it? Well, just with the loss of material culture. Yeah, I mean, I suppose. There's a really inspiring, um, I think she was originally a geographer, um, academic called Kathleen de Silva. And um, she wrote this brilliant essay that all my students, let me see some of them here, are probably sick of me talking about, but thankfully she's, she's now written a whole book about it, so I can kind of bore on about that instead. Anyway, she wrote this amazing um, essay about curating a homestead in Montana, um, in the kind of Northwest United States, where, um, a lot of the objects inside had been kind of, had, were kind of on the way to becoming, she says they were turning from artifacts into eco-facts. They were becoming kind of slime and so on. And so it's what, she, what she talks about is the way that we understand the material world and objects is in far too a fixed way, because most objects are in a process of decay. And, you know, it would be, the world would be even fuller if everything was stabilized and in a kind of fixed moment. And I suppose that's, that's the nature, obviously, of, of conservation and of museums is they're, they're highly artificial because they're arresting the kind of natural processes that, that artifacts go through. So I suppose in terms of loss, if we kind of see artifacts as kind of going through processes rather than as fixed entities, I think that's kind of one way to handle it. And also to accept that we can't, we can't keep producing and keep storing and so on and, and things have to be let go and that in kind of the death of objects, there's, you know, the ability for new objects or renewal or, and so on. Um, so Christine, do you want to come in here? Just, yeah. just chip in on, yeah. on that. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was at a, a conference. We were talking about 3D replication of objects, which we touched on. Um, and somebody from a museum in the UK said, well, we have a storage problem. I mean, you know, why should we curate and keep everything? And storage costs money were attached to objects um, and the person in charge of the funding of the museum had said well now that you can 3D scan things and store it as a virtual object you don't need to keep the actual object it's disposable and every single archaeologist and anthropologist in the room went oh, yeah, that's a dreadful idea so that's our attachment as scholars to objects but yeah. you know that that could be a future thing so I mean another thing I mean, I'm thinking an absolutely awful thing that happened earlier this year, of course, was the burning down of the uh, museum in, in Brazil mm -hmm. um, and the loss of objects. And one of the things that sort of helped them move forward from that, it has been collecting photographs and creating 3D replicas. So I imagine with Notre Dame that there probably are lots. Of, it doesn't bring the original back, but there are probably a lot of records that will allow them to, to replicate and store things as well. Yeah, I mean, that, that's the danger of studying material culture. Then you see everything as material culture. You don't want to let anything go. At the same time, you see a kind of equivalence between things, and so you're, you're less precious about things in other ways. So it's kind of funny. Yeah. I think one last question. We're sort of running out of time, please. A very quick thing. Um, BBC Four, late at night, in the last week or so, had a series about the art of living in Japan. And it's just to say, if people see it come up again, 
it absolutely blew my mind about how people stop, see things and recognize objects in a different way. And one example was a master carpenter explained why Japanese saws are used to pull towards you rather than to push against, and why a wood plane you pull towards you instead of push against, what the philosophy of it was. It's mind-blowing stuff. Um, you'll never see an object the same way again. So it was the art of living in Japan. Was it Radio 4? No, BBC 4 television. Oh, BBC 4 television. That's lovely. I think it was three sections. I only saw one episode. Yeah, nobody will hear you without the mic in. Anyway, that's okay. Listen, thank you very, very much. And that's a nice note on which to end. Um, so all I want to do is make a few announcements. So bear with me and then we'll thank uh, 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 Lisa uh, and Christine. Firstly, is this is a series of lectures, so the next in our series, What It Means to Be Human in the 21st Century, is a performance by the Canadian production company La Messe Basse, uh, which is a one-woman show called Siri. And that's actually going to take place in the Samuel Beckett Theatre on the 13th of May. The tickets are for sale and they're available on the Hub website. So the other announcements I want to make is on the 1st of May, we've got the French philosopher and writer Bernard-Henri Lévé, who's uh, uh, delivering a dramatic reading as part of his 22-city European tour looking for Europe, um, which is a text against populism. Now that is currently sold out, but, uh, and you have to buy tickets for that, but if tickets become available, and we hope additional tickets will become available, Obviously, if your name's on the list, uh, we'll be delighted. So it's Eventbrite, you just uh, need to put your name on the waiting list. Then I want to also give a plug to our Out of the Ashes series. And given what's happening this evening in Notre Dame, it could not be uh, uh, more pertinent. It's going to be a lecture on the 20th of May uh, on the labour of forgetting with Anne uh, Laura Stoller from the New School for Social Research in New York. So again, you can register, that's a free event, and register on the Trinity Long Room Hub uh, website. So I want to wrap things up simply by a few thank yous. Thank you, of course, to the Trinity Long Room Hub team who worked so hard to make these events happen. I want to thank you all for coming out on such a greasy, miserable, wet evening and uh, bringing uh, 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 such energy and such great questions uh, to this evening. I want to thank Christine for her tremendous um, uh, 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 I was going to say, oh, it was interview you. She curated that conversation fabulously. But above all, uh, to thank Lisa again for just a lovely talk. So thank you very much.